Good morning. Uh, hello, my name is Michelle Lisa Palisade. I'm the Education and Community Engagement Manager at Ulite Arts, and I am so happy to have you all with us today. Uh, welcome to our final uh, iteration of the Artist Toolbox 101 program. Today we'll be talking about managing finances and budgets. Um, and before we officially get started with the program, I just wanted to thank everybody who's attended the last four of these sessions. This was a very uh, major labor of love for me uh, to the artist community in Miami. I was really excited to create some programming that would focus on the more basics of being an artist. I know there's these really big picture thoughts, but I thought it was really important to get our, our artists engaged um, in something that would give them the tools that they need to like do everything. Like this is like the package that you need. And I think this program has been able to successfully do so. Um, as Danielle has been putting in the chat, please put all your questions in the Q&A feature, not the chat feature. It makes it a little easier for the panelists and myself. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, our partners at ReadyMag, if you attended the last program, you know this already, are going to be extending a free workshop demo as well as 25% off of their web building platform. So I really, if you are interested in attending the program, I'll put that um, Zoom link for the registration in the chat a little bit later as well. So today I'm very excited to have Amanda Sanfilippo and um, Roxana Barba with us today. Roxana is an artist and arts administrator with over 20 years of experience in her practice. Her practice includes references to ritual and cultural memory and incorporates inter interdisciplinary uses of dance, film, and video. Um, she serves as the projects administrator with Miami-Dade County. Miami-Dade County Cultural Affairs Departments, where she manages grants programs for both nonprofit arts organizations, as well as individual artists. And then we also have Amanda Sanfilippo Long. She is a curator and artist manager of the Art and Public Places program at Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs. I don't know why I can't say that sentence, <laughs> that title. Um, she's also the director of the South Florida Con Cultural Consortium and the senior advisor and former executive director and chief curator of French projects. Um, she initiated uh, and directed Art and Public Places co-presentation of the Creative Time Summit in 2018 as well. She's also held positions at a number of institutions, including Locust Projects, where I actually met Amanda and Creative Time in New York. So at this time, I'd like to welcome both Roxana and Amanda to the virtual stage to join me. Hi. <laughs> so nice to see you today. Um, so Hi, Michelle. if you're down to just get into it, I'm ready to go. Are you? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Thank you, Michelle. Let's talk about money. <laughs> oh, wrong screen. Oh no. <laughs> mm. The my conundrum with having the the share screen feature. I always make some fumble here. Okay, let's try again. Share screen. And this is my right one. And yeah, there we go. That's great. All right. So managing finances and budgets. Okay, I really liked this quote. I was really glad. Um, <laughs> I love, I love this quote. Um, so budgeting is financial storytelling. It you know it gives it a, a poetic perspective, but it is exactly that. Um, when it comes to reading a budget that a panelist or juror may be trying to understand. In essence, what you're trying to do is just tell the story of your project. So um, I thought that uh, when when she said that, she captured the, the truth uh, behind budgeting. Yeah, it's really important uh, to think about your budgets in this way, as, mm -hmm. as silly as it might sound. So Absolutely. things to consider. Yeah, so, um, you know, we wanted to cover um, things that we believe are important when it comes to budgeting. Uh, there are many things that, that fall under uh, managing finances for artists, and we're not going to be able to uh, have time to touch on all of those things. So we just wanted to mention a few that we believe are important and focus um, much more on budgeting and the types of budgets that artists are usually working with. But you know, when it comes to managing finances, um, a good place to start is to understand your needs and also know what your objectives are with your finances. So if your objective is to sustain your practice as well as yourself, um, 
you know, you, you need to know how to do that and where you're headed with those things. Um, objectives are very important and coming up with plans so that little by little you can reach those objectives are also very important. Um, and also taking care of yourself is absolutely important. So determining what your um, annual monthly figures are to, uh, to be able to work and live as you would like to is, is always a good place to start. Uh, and if you want you to work your way uh, up to certain goals, then include those little by little. Um, the next thing is the financial system. So, you know, many things work, um, work differently for different people. So it's just about, um, discovering the, the things that work for you. Uh, usually it's recommended that you touch base on, on your bookkeeping or your accounting on your bills, et cetera, once a month. And you take a look at uh, where you are with those goals, or you take a look at, uh, you know, bookkeeping with a project that you're doing that you may be so consumed with that you've had little time to, to sit with your bills, with, uh, where you are with the expenses, et cetera. So a uh, financial system that involves, okay, looking at things once a month or more than that, um, and then determining what type of bookkeeping um, is also important. So I, I personally love Google Sheets and Excel Sheets, um, and there are so many templates out there that are customizable for, for your needs. Um, so that's, that's, those are very important things. Um, and the last thing about organizing yourself is um, Lauren herself was saying how important it is to always, uh, when she has like this monthly big budget meetings, um, she orders a nice meal, right? So to, to make it a little bit lighter, to treat yourself to maybe um, a glass of wine or a nice meal might be a good way to, to tackle <laughs> something that, usually may we may dread or we you know we we are a little bit uncomfortable to look at or scared to look at so just creating certain ease is important because once you establish that routine then you're going to have a better grasp of everything that you're working with uh grants and commissions are also something to consider when you are um managing your overall needs so keeping a calendar of deadlines is very helpful and continuously updating the, uh, the calendar so that you create also time, the right time to work on those applications because those uh, applications or budgets are going to demand you to do research on expenses, are going to possibly mean that you're gonna to have to contact people to let them know that you want to work with them or how much they charge for services. So it is a lot of work and you and, and managing all of that uh, takes uh, some attention. Sales, if you are uh, already selling work or, um, or working your way to do that is also another thing to include in your budget. And tax reporting is also an extremely important piece. And Amanda and I, um, you know, uh, are we know that it's important to either work with a very good accountant to understand your your practice, to understand uh, the types of deductions that that you should be considering, and not somebody that has you know a difficult time understanding what you do. So. Um, now, if you are doing your own taxes, more power to you, that, that's great, but uh, we're not gonna be able to dive into that section yet, but we, we, um, we always recommend that you take that um, really seriously and um, online research you know, can always help as well. That's great. And Michelle, I think you mentioned that you guys are going to do a deep dive on taxes um, a little bit later on. Anyway. Yeah, the goal is to do a, a real session that's all about taxes. So uh, we're not going to talk about that today because obviously budgeting is its own uh, can of worms. But yeah, yeah. Taxes will come in the future of this program for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, Amanda, you want me to continue? Oh, sure. Um, I, I can, I just don't want to. Sure, yeah, no, that's great. I'll, I'll jump in um, in, in here, if it, but why don't you please, uh, please start of yourself. Okay, great, thank okay. you. Okay, so um, this image of, uh, you know, of a jigsaw puzzle, puzzle or, or a pie chart, um, these images are helpful to understand what a budget is and uh, when, when we're thinking about the concept of, of a budget. So at the end, a budget is a, is a big thing, a big uh, puzzle that comes together mm-hmm. and that fits. So pieces are gonna start fitting together. And one way to look at this is to start with the easier things, whichever those are for you. So if the cost of materials is something very easy for you, you can start with those. Mm -hmm. If your own artistic fees are easy for you, you can start with those, if studio rental. So find the things that that are easy for you and work your way from there. Uh, but at the, at the very end, going back to the initial quote, the budget has to tell a story. So the, uh, when, when, as a reader and um, I have, you know, in my job, I have to review budgets and most, uh, most of the time I, I try to help people to help them improve their budgets. But mm-hmm. I also sometimes participate as a, as a juror myself. And when I see a budget and when I see a project uh, the budget doesn't really represent what the budget is doing, Mm. then I have questions and that's when the trouble begins. So Mm -hmm. it's very important that you take your time to research the costs of your project because panels most of the time are able to tell when you haven't done so um, and that you know, you are thinking of all the details that you're mentioning in your narrative and making sure that you're capturing all of those costs. So yeah. for example, if you say, you know, that, um, that you're going to document the work, that you're going to hire a videographer or a photographer to document the work, but the budget doesn't have a line item for documentation, for photography, for um, videography, then you you missed something. Um, This little mistakes, one, two, may not be a big deal if 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 the panel is excited with your project, but you always want to try to, as much as possible, cover all the bases because you know these applications are uh you're competing against other applicants mm-hmm. so at the end of the day when the race is tight you want to have as many things as possible working on your behalf yeah and you know something else um roxana to add to what you're saying is that you know when you start with a budget it seems really simple and it, it sometimes is like oh this is a no-brainer but budgets actually have revenue and of course they have expense So, um, you know, every budget is a two part thing. Everything is always about how much money am I working with and then how much am I spending? And, you know, the goals that they they equal out um, one way or another. There's, there's, um, There's some templates that you can use that help you calculate both of these at the same time, Um, but then I find it very simple to just do want have one for revenue and one for expense. And I think at the county level, when you're doing project grants for like community grants programs, you're going to be asked to do one revenue budget and one expense budget. And um, so that really is going to help to ground to ground you in the first place. How much money am I working with? Um, Another thing, Roxana, that I find really helpful because I've kind of been on both sides of this process, both as a grant, uh, a grant applicant um, from Locust Projects. uh, and other other or you know fringe projects, but also now as uh, sort of uh, on the other side as more of a grant maker. Um, so you know what's interesting is that when you're saying okay, well look okay, so I've got I've got a, such a this 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 uh, this bucket of money. How do I even start carving this apart? So um, you know there's kind of there's sort of um, what we, we call them like norms or um, or recommendations that come from our organization at Miami Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs. It's not the same for everyone, and you know, with the ULAC grants and, and the WaveMaker grants, that there's a couple of different ways to you know that that these organizations are recommending you put your budgets together. But we typically do a couple of different sort of things like. Um, 
you know, there's a, a certain percentage that we might recommend you pay staff with. It's typically about 25% of the overall project budget. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Roxana, but that was my, my yeah, memory. That's of, right. of, yeah, and then, and then, you know, and that's all the staff. That's all the administration and staff that you're paying. May or may not count for artists. Um, I think it's actually not, that, that doesn't include artists, artistic labor. It's more like the people that are working to get the project going and make it happen. Um, and then there's another one which has to do with in kind. Um, in kind is, is a concept that I think we're gonna brush on later and describe more what it is, but in kind can contribute up to 25% of your budget as well. So in kind is actually stuff that actually has a, good, a fair market value, something that's worth real money um, <clears throat> that you would have had to pay for, but instead you're getting it for free. But um, the county and many other not-for-profit grant making or um, organizations um, will will give you the you know they'll count that as real money in your budget, meaning like they'll match it. If it's a matching grant, they'll match it with real money. They'll count it as real money in your in your grant application. Um, I think Roxana, you might have some really good tips to share about how to deal with the in kind um, concept because it can be a little bit confusing because you can say, oh, well. Okay, well, I, I have this this stuff that that's worth real money, but um, but I don't have the money, <laughs> so I have to figure out you know how much real money I actually have, and that yes. that becomes important to track, you know, yes. when you're tracking your actual revenue, um, that you actually know that what you have in real dollars and what you have as an in kind value. Um, that's a little bit more of a complex thing, but it's basically like that twenty five percent. Uh, for in kind that 25% for, um, you know, for, for the staff and then, and then you've got, you know, the rest you're, you're going to work on these other things. So just to comment on that last slide. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to focus a lot of, of budgets for your applications, um, but you know we also want to mention the importance of keeping your own budgets and and this mm. and this domino effect that we're seeing here uh, can be the negative domino effect of of not um, of not knowing where the money is going of perhaps overspending mm. funds and and I am talking about a personal experience um, you know of. Um, a few years ago, we did a project that was very ambitious, uh, my collaborator and I, and we started getting very excited and it was, um, it was, a, it was incredibly time consuming and, and I sort of started to, uh, you know, push money or, or the bookkeeping to the side. Um, and there were uh, many other factors that contributed to the domino effect in this, in this situation, but what we're trying to say is that keeping a budget and keeping yourself honest and accountable is going to help protect you, your finances, um, the integrity of your, of your work, your health, et cetera. So yeah. we, can't, uh, we can't emphasize enough how important it is just to, just to know how yeah. the money is being spent. Yeah, and, and it's also, I think, like one of those tools, Roxana, that you can put in your budget and it's not always encouraged um, in the kind of community grants budgets or grantee budgets, but having a line item for either contingency or a line item for carryover, um, where you do have an expected amount of carryover, um, and you could even, you know, put in, you know, this is what you expect to have left over that you're going to take into your next project. Um, and it may be something that, you know, supports, you know, you, you may be able to identify, but carryover um, is something that I learned about actually only when I joined the county. And it's really something that keeps, keeps the domino effect from not happening where you're going, oh man, like I actually need to start funding my next year's gig. And now I have to take Rob Peter to pay Paul. So um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's things that can, especially when you're working project to project, it becomes, um, you know, extremely difficult when you don't have sort of like an endowment or something like, you know, like a major not for profit is going to have a savings account that they're essentially they're carrying over. They're not planning to spend. They just have a buffer. Well, if you're going project to project as an individual artist, it's almost impossible to do that because you're on the hook to spend what you said you would spend uh, for your grant. So, you know, kind of trying to plan as much as you can for a little bit of carryover, a little bit of contingency, see what you can get away with. That's a, uh, you know, a-okay to me in my book. <laughs> exactly. 
All right. Um, mm. The one thing that what that we want to also emphasize a lot today is uh, paying yourself. Um, there are many ways to arrive to your hourly rate, daily rate, weekly rate. And in this presentation, we included some links from Creative Capital, which is an organization based in New York that has been working with uh, artists who have been uh, providing professional development to other artists. So perhaps artists who are uh, a little more advanced in their careers are turning around and providing all these incredible tools to emerging mid-career artists. And one of the, uh, and they have several exercises to determine these rates. It's very important that you know what these are uh, because you're gonna need them to create your budgets. You're gonna need them to create quotes whenever you're asked uh, to provide a service. Um, and you, and at all times, you should be thinking of paying yourself, unless it's a situation where you decide to do uh, to barter, where you decide, you know, I'm going to do this favor for this artist, and and then in return, she or he is going to help me out. Th uh, that's a different thing altogether. But but you have to be thinking that the time that you're spending researching, the time that you're spending talking to people, meeting, meetings, et cetera. It's money that you, you should technically think that you should be paying yourself. So um, one, uh, you know, and these, these rates may vary uh, um, as well. So you may have a teaching rate, you may have um, an installation rate. So it's, it's important to, to know what rate you're you're working with. And I also listed two other things that you may want to refer to. Uh, Wage is an organization that's, that's doing incredible advocacy work on, on behalf of artists in the industry. And in their website, which, which is absolutely stunning, they have listed many uh, fees that um, they're saying, so this is the minimum that you should be, um, this is a standard industry for payment for an installation, for a solo show, for a group show. Um, and they it's also included in the resources that we have listed. And they are um, holding you know, institutions and funders accountable for, for moving forward and what we need to move all move forward together, which is you know, artists have to be compensated for the work. It's absolutely you know, not, um, not do not go in when you don't when you're not being paid for a project that's that's my advice and then the last thing here is uh the u.s department of labor has an hourly wage you, that you can also consider uh but you the i personally liked the tool that was provided by creative capital i highly recommend it so that you go through that exercise which is to identify what it costs for you to live in one year. And then they have some formulas to help you arrive to that hourly, daily, and weekly rates. Yeah. I wanted, I want to add that I think it's a very common practice for artists to consider their own wage as um, I guess expendable. Like they can kind of like, like that can be the first thing they'll knock off of a budget if they're trying to create something. And I notice it pretty regularly from working at Locust. Um, Ulay artists are very likely to just say, oh, if I can't afford to buy these X materials for this project, I just won't pay myself. Right. Uh, and at the end of the day, what you don't want is for yourself to walk away with just this completed project that might either that may not be bringing you in revenue. Like now, if you're able to sell that project or create some revenue with it in the future, fine. Maybe you can consider paying yourself as an expense that doesn't need to go into the budget. But if you're just making this like say installation that's going to exist one time and you don't pay yourself, you're kind of putting yourself at a loss very quickly. Um, right at the beginning, you're putting yourself at a loss if you're not paying yourself. So yeah, 100%. Right. Yeah, and, and Amanda, um, is uh, when we were having our, our meetings earlier on, she was identifying the, the different types of artistic payments. Um, but, you know, for mostly since we know that uh, perhaps 
uh, most artists today are visual artists, uh, you know, one thing is to be calculating the payment that you should be receiving for, for the concept of idea of your work. Another payment, if you are also fabricating the work yourself, that would be another payment that is that goes for you. And if you are installing the work yourself because artists can pay out for fabrication or installation, then, but if you are doing the installation yourself, that would be payment for yourself as well. So I'm just gonna talk more about that, but we, we definitely want you to walk away today knowing that it's absolutely important to pay yourself. Yeah. yeah, and and you know, thanks, Roxana, and also to the wage guidelines, which is um, this website is is really handy because it does help help you to see what's all the stuff that I should be expecting payment for or requesting payment for if an institution invites me to do something. Um, this might be a lecture. This might be um, you know just simply participating in an exhibition. This might be um, you know a whole a whole number a, a talk that you give um, there's a whole number of different things that you you may, you know artists may may or may not be accustomed to actually expecting or receiving stipends for um, but you know but these are these are sort of the professional pieces of work that that you're you know doing as part of as part of your practice so you know the, it's very much about um, making sure that you're compensated for those things as well that you might not consider as actually, you know, having to do with making the artwork. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it gives you a lot of examples and a lot of ways to go forward. And there's a couple organizations in Miami that are wage certified, uh, BFI, Bass Fisher Invitational, and I think Locust. And I think that's it in town, but I might be incorrect, but yeah. Bravo to them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> bravo. Um, all right, so then going into the types of the types of budgets that um, we think you're mostly working with. So grant application budgets, of course. And uh, it's important to mention that these budget forms are going to vary funder to funder. The form that the county uses for a community grant application is going to be entirely different than the than the budget form that is used. Um, by another county grant, which is Artist Access with a deadline of March 15 for those who are interested. The budget form in the Artist Access application is two or three line items. It's very simple and straightforward. Um, the budgets used for by other local funders like uh, Wavemaker or uh, the Night Art Arts Challenge, they're all going to vary. And it's important for you to familiarize yourself with the guidelines first and with what the budget requirements are. Because uh, in the case of the county, the county asks for balanced budgets, meaning that your expenses are going to equal your revenues. They want to see a balanced budget. Um, not all funders are going to ask for that and not all funders are going to ask for you to capture in kind in one way or the other so it takes a little bit of research and homework to understand what each funder is asking for then we have uh, commission budgets with amanda can talk about much more and bookkeeping budgets which is you know again th those templates that i mentioned earlier uh where you can keep track of what you were projecting things to cost versus what is actually costing you. Okay, so grant budgets. Um, so again, first start with reviewing the guidelines. Uh, they are very visible typically in the program page of the website that you are, um, of the organization that's off or funder that is offering the, the application. Um, and if you start reviewing those guidelines and if you're unsure or do not understand what things mean, absolutely contact the people who are listed as contact and ask all your questions. My recommendation is take advantage as much as possible of uh, you know any sessions that those funders may provide to familiarize yourself with the application because they normally include tips. They normally uh, have um, 
speakers that have applied to those opportunities themselves and can talk about the project as well and help you understand uh, things in a way that you know that you connect more with with uh, what the speaker is saying. Mm -hmm. So definitely do that and reach out. You know, call or email the officer with your questions and take the opportunity to tell them about your project because the the officers or the administrators have experience in helping you best present your project and in helping you understand how your project perhaps is not meeting the guidelines right now, but they may, may mention. So this is not meeting eligibility right now, but what we're looking for is something like that. And if it, and if they if you tell them enough about your work and your practice, they might help you understand what project might be eligible in the future. So it's very important to take the time to do that and to not be scared to send that email or to pick up the phone. Um, then the next bullet, which is that the applications vary. I already covered that. And uh, research and consider the cost of all the activities. So if you are including, for example, um, equipment rental that, uh, that you've never used before, make sure that you look into the cost of those things. If you are including uh, performers as part of your, of your installation, make sure to talk to them and take into account that they're gonna have to put in rehearsal time before they present. So a, a, have that talk, uh, do all the research so that your numbers, again, do the storytelling of your project. Um, and then when you are unsure about uh, either underestimating or overestimating your costs, um, try not to go too low or too high, find that medium. So, um, you know, sometimes uh, people think that by, by going high, you're going to, to be able to get more money. At the panel review level, what the panel wants to see is that that budget makes sense with the project. And when they start seeing that things may be inflated, they start losing trust on the, um, on the ability of the artist to put together uh, either the budget or, or the fact that the, if they did the research or not uh, to present the application. And don't go low. I mean, if, if today paying a photographer to come or, or somebody to do video of your work, that has a cost. So uh, make sure that you talk to them and include uh, their rates and, and, and do not think that you're, you can say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay my, my, my whatever cousin or somebody to do it. Hire a professional, put it in your budget, and don't go low with those expenses. Yeah, I wanted to also add that if you're reaching out to staff, make sure you're reaching out in a timely manner. The worst thing when you're someone who's like on the back end of these kinds of grant programs is you'll have people reach out to you like days before it's due, kind of frantic. Um, and then unfortunately, in most cases, they're not able to actually help you when it's too late. So if you, you know, something opens up in two, three months, as soon as you see that it's open, read it, see what questions you have and reach out. Um, it doesn't help, it doesn't benefit you to wait to the last minute in general with doing this stuff, but it definitely doesn't help if you have questions because you'll end up in a situation where your questions go unanswered. Um, yeah. And I want to also reiterate this, this idea of like the, the numbers. If you go too high, um, you might you might fool someone, right? You might fool a grantor into giving you double the amount of what you actually need for the project, but then you have to actually say you spent it on the things you said you're going to spend it on. And if you can't prove that in some cases, a little rare, but it sometimes sometimes has happened where the grantor does expect you to return the funds that you didn't spend. And the last thing you want to do is have to write a check and say, "Here's the money back" or something. So, um, and I and every and you know that's kind of an unfortunate truth, but it does it can happen like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, just from the perspective of like formally like a development director, you know, like when artists, when you have your sort of office hours, part of your week or your, your month where you sit down and you're looking at, you know, if, if raising grants is part of your practice, um, that's important to you. Um, 
you know, everyone has their own way of being organized, but really developing something called a prospect list where you're looking at what are the opportunities that have coming up, you know, in more or less a list format, like an Excel, what is their due date? What is, what is, what do I have to do a month out? What do I have to do two weeks out, um, you know, two months out or, you know, whatever it may be to, to try to get organized for this, the more organized and more time you actually do get into it, not even so much time, but just getting it early, you, you, you give yourself that opportunity to, to um, really refine the application, get other people to look at it, do the little things you need to do. And time, um, you know, you, you really, you really, uh, you can't beat it in terms of really getting an application right. Just giving yourself, you know, a month versus a week um, and touching base on it a few times is, is priceless to getting that application looking really good. Yeah, absolutely. And and I myself, I, I, I also find myself writing grants and I myself sometimes make the mistake of I start uh, focusing a lot on the narrative and I start because I, I may still be developing the, the ideas yeah. and I give myself a lot of time for that. And then as time starts running out, I, I go, oops, the budget. <laughs> um, and then I, I find myself that I sometimes don't give myself enough time to work on the budget. So right. it, it's, it's a lot of work. It's tricky, but um, keeping the budget, uh, you know, understanding that it is as important as the narrative itself, hopefully reminds us that we give, we need to give it as much importance. Yeah, like you said, it tells the story and it really does. And they're kind of like, the budget's almost like the bullet points of your narrative. <laughs> you know, it's like what's happening here. And yeah, um, yeah it all kind of- I have, um, I have worked with panelists that they start by looking at the budget first. They don't even read the, the application. They start with the budget first mm. and then they go to the application to find the explanation to the numbers. Right. Because they're, they're really they, tangled up in numbers. Yeah. yeah they're, they're people that are numbers driven and that's the way that they interpret and digest information. So, so, you know, those are uh, important things to keep in mind. Yeah. That's great, Roxana. That does bring me back to something that's been brought up in all the other sessions is that um, these applications that you're putting out into the world are parts of a whole, right? And so you have to make sure that every part tells the same story, your narrative, your bio, your CV, your, you know, everything has to be cohesive, right? Um, and that is considering that there are some people who interpret and read this information in a different manner. So that is really nice that you mentioned that there are people who will look at the budget first, because there's people who look at the images first, there's people who look at the narrative first, there's people who just process information differently. And yeah. so you want every panelist that's looking at your, your application to be able to see the exact same story, no matter how they process information or how they feel best um, they can read those through those things. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yep. That they're aligned, yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, so this will this is going to be an exercise on on what we're what we were talking about. Um, so I'm going to take just a, a little bit of time to go through what things mean, such as grant allocations, cash match, in kind. But then I just want to take the budget as a whole, so that we digest the ideas that we were just explaining. So. Um, on the left, we have the expenses. On the right, we have the revenues. The expenses are how much money things are going to cost and the revenues is how much money is going into the project. Um, the expenses and revenues have what we call line items, grant line items, uh, such as on the expenses side, we have the artistic expenses, um, artist, artist fees, installation, studio rental. These are typical line items that we may find in um, artists' budgets. And on the revenues, we have uh, line items such as grants, so money that may be coming from other grants, foundation support, corporate support, individual donors. Um, common line items that you may find. Then as then looking at the what the columns headings are, we have in yellow on the left in the expenses budget, we have the grant allocations. The grant allocation is the amount of the grant that you're requesting and then how you are allocating 
uh, the grant itself. So in this case, if I go to the bottom of the grant allocations column and look at the subtotal, I am requesting $5,000. And then in my yellow column, I am telling the panel how I plan on spending those monies. So I'm allocating 3,000 towards artist fees, and I'm allocating 1,000 to equipment rental, and then the rest is spread between other uh, three line items. So that the first um, column is usually the, the, the where you explain how you're going to allocate the grant. Then the following column is when the grant that you're applying for is uh, asks for matching requirements. So in the cash match, you're going to include expenses that are not going to be covered by the grant, but that are still costing you and are part of the project. And where is this money gonna, going to come from? Well, in your revenues budget, you will have an opportunity to say, well, it's coming from other grants or some foundation support or private individual support or corporate support or, or perhaps it's in-kind support. So you'll be able to say uh, or to indicate the, the panel where this money is coming from. You can include, again, depending on the funders and, and, the, and the guidelines, you can include funding that is not secured, funding that is pending. What does that mean? A grant that you're applying for that you don't know if you're gonna get or not. Sales that you're projecting that you for sure do not know if you're gonna get or not. But you are allowed to include this projected income as well. Um, so that's the cash match column. The third column, the total cash adds up what you have in the first two columns. So as a reader, if I want to understand your budget, and if I'm one of those people that starts with the budget first, I'm going to probably look at the total cash and see, okay, let me see. This is a four month creation period installation project. And they're saying they're going to pay $6,000 to artists. Hmm. That's a little low. So I, I, I put together this, this um, example to try to illustrate the panel's view as well. So for a month, four month creation period, it may be a little low. Um, and then I may have some questions, but it may be just okay. I don't know enough about the project, but that it may be where I start. Then I see total installation costs 800 and I start moving down. I want to know how much cash is being spent on the project. I want to know how much is going to artists. I typically also am interested in marketing because I want to know there are enough dollars allocated towards marketing. Um, and then I also take a look at the in-kind. So uh, the in-kind again is the in-kind are costs that are not costing you. So if I see $200 in installation and that's in kind, that is a cost of 200 that you don't have to pay for, that, uh, that is a cost that's being donated towards the project that has a value. Perhaps uh, you have an installer um, colleague that, that came in to help out, but, and that's his usual rate per, per hour and you build that into your project. Um, documentation, I also see going down. I have an in-kind of 1,000. So in the narrative, I would like to see that, I would like to see an explanation for those in-kind uh, $1,000 that you're allocating towards documentation. Perhaps the documentation, um, will be done, uh, this is in a, in a way a, a co-presentation and perhaps the, the other artist or a co-collaboration, the other artists are covering the cost of the documentation. So it's not costing you, it's a cost that's, that's covered. And that explains why it is an in-kind cost. So that, that this, this is just to illustrate the type of things that I maybe start asking or looking for in the narrative just by looking at your budget. And then, then in the revenues, of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look where the money is coming from and I'll see, okay, some foundation grants, corporates and private individual support. 
the rule of thumb is, is that the funders, and this is most, mostly for organizations, not so much for artists, but that for organizations, they like to see, uh, you know, income sources that are spread out. Um, they don't want to see just one source of income going into the project, but for artist projects is, it's okay. And you can explain where the money com is coming from in your narrative as well. In this particular budget, I also decided to put a balanced budget. So on the expenses budget to the left, on the bottom, you have that your total expenses, 12,200, are equaling your total revenues. And this is what we call a balanced budget. And in red, I see, uh, I put a deficit of zero dollars. Normally, you're not gonna see that term in a grant application. It, it was just something to illustrate the exercise today. Um, so this would be a, a, a balanced budget. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say, they don't even want you to consider a deficit as a possibility. Like there has to be a balance with grants 100 percenters. You should never submit a grant budget uh, unbalanced. It doesn't look good for you, application-wise. Yep. Um, what else would be important to mention about a grant application budget? Um, <laughs> the, what? No. I mean, the, the research is key because, you know, if I'm, if I am not, um, too experienced with paying for marketing myself, you know, I may want to talk to some people to estimate how much to allocate towards marketing. So if you go to lower, if you go to high, that might be a little bit of a red flag. Same with equipment rental, same with everything else pretty much in your budget. You want to feel comfortable with the numbers that you see in. Perhaps you know, you're know you most comfortable with your materials because you know how much they cost. And, and that's, that's where you would start. But um, make sure that the numbers in your budget, you know, you're comfortable with them. You did the research, you know why it would cost that. And again, this is a budget that's on the on the low end. And also if you see, I added contingency all the way to the bottom. In this instance, I decided not to add any because typically, uh, for example, with, with, um, with the county for community grants, that is a line item that is not allowed. But for artist budgets, um, ask the administrator, ask the officer and definitely include it in your budget if it's allowed. All right. Yeah, and um, sometimes Roxana, what's handy is you'll get the opportunity to make, there's like a notes column that you can write. So if you're like, oh, yeah. you know, what is this cost justified by um, second, such and such hour, you know, 10 artists at, you know, $1,000 per stipend or, you know, whatever, you can actually get in a couple of those notes and that's, that's super helpful and that can match up with your narrative. Yeah, exactly. And um, it, when, when we were, when we we're projecting in kind as well, um, you know, if you are um, thinking that you're going to have some people who are going to help you with the installation, um, then add that in as in-kind and try to account for the number of hours that they spent doing that and, um, and consult wage, consult, you know, other people to see how much they would typically charge. If they're not professional, then consider that and perhaps you know account for a little bit less when it comes to the hourly rate but build those in kind expenses into your budget typically mm -hmm. with uh, it's it's considered that you can add up to 25% of the total project budget can be considered in kind and you're going to show your in kind and again this is with the county budget forms uh, i have found that in with other funders it may vary um, the in-kind that you see in the expenses will correspond to the in-kind that you see in the revenues. So uh, if my in-kind from uh, corporate support is not reflected somewhat in my expenses, you know, the, the panel will have some questions. Um, so for example, here uh, I have 900 in corporate support and in-kind. And if I'm looking at the expenses and I see 
the the income expenses there, I could say, okay, so then equipment rental, perhaps that was a donation plus the the wood, perhaps that was a donation as well. Um, that is adding up to the corporate support. And then the private individual support of 1200 would be the addition of the installation 200 plus the documentation 1000, which means that if somebody did that service for the project without getting paid and it's considered a private individual support that would fall in your revenues budget as in kind. Mm. So, so these are hopefully things that uh, you'll be considering. And again, don't feel intimidated to ask and to also, uh, you know, draft some, some budget um, uh, preliminary drafts. And if the administrator would, uh, sometimes that can be a little tricky, but if the administrator is, is willing to help you a little bit with the budget, because you express that that's where you have mo most difficulty with, then yeah. run those numbers by that administrator. That might be yeah. a good idea. Like you said, you know, try to get them like two weeks, at least 10 days out, um, if like your latest and, and just be like, you know, could I make a quick appointment with you? I have a budget sample. Um, would you mind taking, you know, 15 minute call with me? And oftentimes that 15 minutes will save you 15. No, I don't know. It'll it'll save you a lot of money yeah. and and uh, and time because they'll set you straight. And it's very helpful to, to schedule appointments with people and um, try to do that with enough time out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, commission budgets, slightly different. Yeah. So, um, you know. Roxana, I think your budget the, for grants and for projects is, is really similar to artist budgets when we're coming, when we're talking about um, commissions and, and specific, you know, production of new art, um, new artworks. And, um, you know, obviously coming from art in public places where we're, we're dealing with uh, commission proposals, this is the kind of thing that really helps to get, you know, get your budget together, but it also translates to projects as well, to some degree. Um, there's, there's just a, a, a couple of basic things that are going to fit into that, these, these commission budgets when you're producing new work. Um, uh, there are, um, you know, fabrication costs, materials costs, installation costs, um, your studio overhead, what does it cost to keep your studio running? And if you need to pay some people to keep, you know, as, as part of that cost, um, for a commission budget, um, we, we recommend at Art in Public Places a, a dollar amount of per, between 15 and 18 um, percent. Sometimes it goes up to 20 percent. This is definitely a little bit lower than if you're working with a commercial gallery and you might be splitting 50-50 or whatever deal you come up with your dealer. Um, but, you know, it's, it's sort of the industry standard for a commission. Um, we recommend always putting a contingency amount in your budget and adding a couple of line items for documentation and marketing. This depends on the funder and, and the project. Um, so, um, you know, each one of these budgets, just these simple, simple bullets might represent to you the whole number or it might just represent to you a header of a category. All right, so in fabrication, you might have that as your header category and then you might have like three or four different line items underneath fabrication of different things that you're paying for within that. And then, you know, that's basically what we call subcategories. So, you know, it just helps you to say, okay, what are the main areas of stuff that I need to pay for? And then if I need to break down those areas further, uh, that's absolutely fine. You can even have like a subtotal for each one of these main line items. And it's really helpful because it lets you kind of get a grip on what you're spending in each area. Um, these budgets for us, at least for Art and Public Places, um, Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs are preliminary. Like we understand that this is a pitch. This is your high level research. Um, this is what your research is yielding. Um, however, you know, things such as materials, how can you get closer to that number? Well, um, it depends on, on the project and every, and of course, with every, every unique circumstance, but you know, how do, how do you start even getting close to a number that you can understand? Well, you're going to be reaching out to professionals. You're going to be trying to reach out to different entities that can give you not only quotes, but, you know, understanding how much, how much of a material might I need 
and about how much do I have to pay for, for a square foot of that material? And just starting to do some very, very basic calculations of, you know, what's, this, what's the price per unit and how many units of this thing do I think I'm gonna need? Um, and that, that just gives you some place to start. Um, start looking at, you know, look the scope of the project, even for you to shop around with different fabricators and people that can give you quotes. Um, earlier, uh, Roxana said something that was really important, which is that, you know, artists uh, tend to um, take that artist fee and go ahead and, and you know, spend it on something else because you're really feeling the pressure to get your project done. And that's really understandable. Um, and, and also that, you know, if you, if you are the person doing the fabrication, whether it's something that you uh, simply, um, no one else can do but you, um, or if it's like, say, for example, if you're a painter and you're just literally painting on canvas, um, you're going to give yourself, um, you know, you're still going to give yourself your artist fee and then you're going to give yourself your studio hour time of what that costs, how much time that costs um, for you to paint that piece of work in your studio. Um, so, so those are actually separate or it could translate to things that other people can do, not just you. So if you're saying, well, look, I can save money, um, I can, or I, I can do it myself, I can, I can make my own stretcher, I can, um, you know, I, I can do this, you know, powder coating or whatever, if you happen to have that, you would be paying someone to do that if you didn't have that skill. So you should actually be putting that as a line item, even if you are spending that money on your, even if you're going to pay yourself to do that, even if you're the fabricator, um, that's still not going to encroach on your own, um, your own artist fee. Okay. So that artist fee is like your golden goose that you're going to put aside <laughs> and you're, you're not going to touch it. And, and the reason for that is because that's your fee for the artist with the ideation of the concept. That's your creative thought. That's your original thinking. That's all of the tiny, teeny things that come together in your life that allowed you to come up with the idea. And, and that's something that you're going to put away in a bucket and you're just going to forget about as in terms of the amount of money in your project budget. Um, a couple other of very wide, you can see wide ranging suggestions here for the artist fee, or rather for, for the other line items. Um, I've already touched on artist fee. Contingency on the bottom right is kind of something that I do recommend you, you, you also make kind of like a hard line on, um, whether it's 5% at the bare minimum, you may want to go up to as far as 10 if you have some really major unknowns in your project. Um, but you know, 5% is your bare minimum. And so knowing that you've got your artist fee and your contingency sort of squared away, call that 20 to 25% of your budget, more or less, you know, you've got about 75% left that you're going to deal with other things. Um, as Michelle has really uh, beautifully put up on the screen, we have, you know, materials, um, who got 20 to 50% installation, 20 to 50%. These ranges are really wide because it totally depends on your project and as you start to put these pieces together. But you know, having a sense of the things that you know you wanna pay for, um, you know, uh, these are guidelines. And so you know, you know you've got that like 75%, um, so, you know, 80 to 75% left to pay for installation materials, studio overhead fabrication documentation, which as Roxana said, is really expensive and, and it's worth every penny because if you have crappy documentation of, you know, your, your, your project, you know that that's something you're always going to uh, regret <laughs> because um, the, those images are really important and valuable. So you want to pay a professional to do that. Or if you do have the skills, great, but you know, you really, you know, photography, it's not only about, um, as we all know, it's not only about just shooting the image and, and getting it and and great light and everything else. It's also about finishing the images. So the editing uh, on the back end um, and touching up the images, not, not like Photoshopping them, but just correcting light, um, doing these things that make the photographs really, really worthwhile. That's also the work that a professional photographer will be doing um, when you pay them. <clears throat> um, and you're participating in the, in the creative economy, so why not? <laughs> um, and then um, marketing, this totally depends. This line item may completely go away if you're working with an institution that's doing in-house marketing, um, or you may wanna say, hey, you know what? I need to put aside some dollars for myself because I wanna you know, pay, maybe I wanna pay an assistant to put together a newsletter for me or to catalog 
um, my stuff or to make sure that my social media is being handled or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, you, you, you have the prerogative to put that money aside and make sure it's going to be spent, you know, how you, how you, you know, desire it to be spent. Um, so yeah, that labor thing, the artistic labor, even if it's, you know, that's the, that's the main thing here is that when you're putting a budget together, even if you're painting the, the painting, you should be paying yourself in addition to your artist fee to do that. And just to go back to a couple of slides ago, Roxana had a really handy tool of how to decide how much to pay yourself per hour. You know, if you were to say, okay, well, I'm an artist, um, what do I pay myself to paint for an hour? Um, is that $20? Is it $40? Is it $100? You know, how do I start to decide what my, my hourly rate to do this kind of work is? And, in, and just, you know, creating a sense of, well, this is going to take me 30 hours to paint this. Like, this is a serious thing. So I need to actually, you know, get that into some kind of uh, numerical organization here. Yeah. So that is, I think I've covered this slide here, unless, um, Roxana, you want to weigh in on any parts of it. I'm good. I'm good. It's great, Amanda. I did want to say something yeah. as an artist. Um, with materials, I think it's really important to consider that when you're buying materials, especially in instances where you have like a larger sum of money for a commission, mm. it's the materials that you actually can use for the future. So try to, at that moment, make a point to buy things that maybe are like upgrades. Like if you have a really old piece of equipment that you have been wanting to upgrade, take oh. that opportunity to do so in that moment because it's coming from this budget for this project that you're going to be using it on. Yeah, you um, make a great point. So it's not only about like traditional things that we might think of in a studio. This could be a new computer. This could be, um, you know, some kind of technology, new camera that you really need to make um, make this thing. Because what are you, ex you know, is the organization expecting that you're just going to have all this stuff ready to go, uh, ready for, for to use? You know, you might have some of the stuff, but you might not. So if you're pitching this, you guys say like, look, I need, you know, this is this is a tool that I need, and it might not be a conventional tool, you know, like that you might expect. 100%, yeah. Yeah, that's a cool. great point, Michelle. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, some tips. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, this is also kind of coming from the experience of working with art in public places that, um, you know, is, is kind of, um, a little bit more of an advanced stage or, but it does help for planning as well, because when you start to think about what it is that you're going to make, you do have to think about um, something that's very simple that we call a work plan. And the work plan is, is more or less about what needs to happen at what stage of the project and how much am I going to need to pay for that? You know, if, if you're doing a project that's a relatively low budget, I think this still has just as much of an effect because you're still dealing with, you know, when are these dollars going to leave me and what am I going to, where am I going to be at at each stage? So this can be as simple as a, you know, an Excel sheet or a Word document that you're saying, yeah, what, what are the, what are the milestones or what are the things that are happening and how much do I need to do each one of those? And do I need that money ahead of time? Do I need it? after the fact, you know, how do all these things link up together? So just getting that down on paper um, is a tremendously uh, important uh, tool of uh, creating this work plan. And then, uh, you know, more than likely, you're going to be need needing to communicate that to whoever you've hired to help you do the project, or whoever is funding you, depending on how hands on or hands off they are. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in art and public places, we're, we're, we're a little bit of both hands on and hands off. So I would say that there's like a, a mixture of, um, of these things, but, you know, they, they, you know, more, more or less your funders or your commissioners are going to want to know how you're planning to spend this money. Um, art in public places is uh, perhaps a bit unique because um, if you were to be awarded a commission, you're actually going to get um, those commission dollars in your own bank account or in your, you know, whatever you, uh, business entity you've set up, and you're the primary person responsible for handling those dollars. So you're actually responsible for hiring your subcontractors for paying out the different expenditures that you will need to. It's not like it's going to be paid from the organization. And this is kind of how this works oftentimes with grants as well, with many grants. You're getting this big chunk of money, and you've got to decide how you're going to deal with it. 
um, and how it's going to go out. Most of it's going to leave you, you know, most of it is going to go out, out of your bank account um, mm -hmm. as, you know, pretty cr quickly after you get it. So, um, so there, there, it's important to realize that, you know, with things fluctuating in and out, you really need to keep track of what, what you expect to come and, and what you need step to step. Um, we already touched upon that. If you're fabricating on your own, this should be a separate budget item outside of your fee. Really, really important. Um, consider your studio overhead. How much is your rent, your assistant? Absolutely. I mean, this is a major, major part of the budget. And um, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't consider that the funder, you know, um, don't, don't give anything away for free. <laughs> you know, charge them for everything. Um, and that, that's important. Um, Keep an estimated and an actual column, very important as well. This kind of goes into that bookkeeping. Um, and as things start to come into reality, this will be important not only for your own records, um, but also for any reporting that will need to happen at the end of the project, um, particularly the grant project. You'll almost always be asked to do a grant report. Um, but in these commissions as well, you know, um, and commissions, you know, they happen for public art, but they often happen you know, at the institutional level as well, where you're working with a museum um, or a gallery and you're actually working to produce new work. Anytime you're making new stuff, this is what you're gonna run into. Um, consider in-kind costs and how to value them. Yeah, this is, this can be, this can be again tricky because you're, you're you know, you don't wanna overinflate this category um, and you don't want to get mixed up in terms of how many real dollars you actually have. Um, Sometimes it's tempting, you know, to to say like, oh, I'm getting, you know, I'm overinflating these in in kind dollars, you know, of this thing that's really worth. Is it really worth, uh, you know, five thousand dollars to you? Is it really worth? Is it really something you'd have to go buy for five thousand dollars? That's kind of the way you want to think about it in real money terms. Um, touching upon hidden costs like taxes and insurance. This is kind of something that's um, oftentimes completely removed from the pitch process. So like if you are to, um, like when you're making a grant application or where you're making a, 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 an a, you know, a pitch for a public art commission or you're putting together a budget for an institution for an, a, a commission or producing new work, um, you're hardly ever gonna think about the fact that um, when you're, when you're say you're receiving $50,000 and it's gonna go into your bank account. Well, you're gonna need to get really squared up with your accountant to make sure that you're declaring properly how much of that is earned revenue and how much of that is a business expense. Because you can get really slammed on a big chunk of money coming into your account if you're not accounting for what is a business cost that's gonna fly right out of your account. You know, you're gonna spend it on your subs, you've got to buy materials um, or what you're actually keeping. You should only be taxed on that money that you actually keep as your profit. And um, that's that's really key, especially when you're being asked to, you know, be the financial, you know, um, fiscal agent, if you will, of that money. Um, a lot of not-for-profits um, will, you know, consider being fiscal agents for smaller organizations that uh, that don't, you know, that aren't set up um, financially, that don't have, you know, business entities. Um, Artists sometimes when they do commissions with us at Art in Public Places, they will actually go and set up a company so that they can run this, these funds through their, through their company and not through their own um, you know, uh, social security number, IRS identity. But those are complicated questions that you know, um, really need to be addressed with your accountant so that you fully understand you know, how, how you wanna manage your, this money, this chunk of money you have coming at you. So you don't get screwed later. <laughs> um, so, all right, stay in touch with your contact with the organization, ask them questions and don't get intimidated. Absolutely, these people are here to help you take advantage of your access. Um, don't, uh, you know, don't shy away ever from asking for things that you need, especially in terms of compliance or things that you're being asked to do. More communication is, is always better. Well, that's great. So bookkeeping, um, this was, I mean, this is kind of like a lot of what we've talked, touched on this whole time was like keeping records of everything that you spend, everything that you project um, and having like an, a projected expenses and an actual expenses for everything that you're doing. And, and by bookkeeping, we kind of mean like putting all of that together. Because at the end of the year, if you did say five projects, you don't want all those separate budgets completely um, separate 
uh, anymore. At the end of the year, when you're getting ready for tax season, you want to be able to account for all of that in one place. So. Mm -hmm. I suggest using something like QuickBooks or a very organized Google Sheet. I say very organized because sometimes you just start throwing things into Google Sheets and you don't actually organize it in a way that's legible for somebody else. Um, and then also just keeping track of where the funding sources were coming from. So that again, like what Amanda was just touching on with taxes, when you're going to do your taxes, you wanna be able to explain where the money came from, mm. uh, how the money was spent. Oh, yeah very clear that uh, it wasn't all just like, you know, you didn't just get, you know, say if you get a, a project of $100,000, you didn't just get $100,000 yeah. in your bank. And Michelle, if I may, you know, I also want to say that, you know, um, once you get into, if you're awarded a project and you're moving ahead with it, um, something that you actually may want to try to get ahead of with your accountant or with your, you know, accounting professional is, should I actually put a line item in my budget here for what I expect to have to pay in taxes? So it's not a big surprise, you know, it's, if you have that line item actually in that, you know, um, not in your proposal budget, but now it's in your real working budget of what you're dealing with on a day to day that has your, your actuals, um, you know, getting that actual line item for, am I, is my tax bill going to be 3000? Is it going to be 8,000? You know, I need to know what that's going to be because I'm going to be hit really hard with that um, during tax season if I'm not aware of it, you know, so um but thanks for, for bringing that up. Very yeah. important. I also say in the beginning of the year, maybe even for yourself, keep a budget of like what you expect to spend that year on just like existing, right? Like how much you expect to spend on rent, life, like all those things. So that as you're working through your budgets, you can kind of see where the funding is coming from for funding your life. Mm. And then also thinking of like uh, looking, like I say here, be aware of categories where you may have a budget deficit. So thinking about where you're over, you may be overspending, you may be spending beyond your means for your projects or your practice as an artist so that you're not, um, so you're a little bit more aware of where you need to focus and work on as you're moving forward each year. Uh, your, you know, money is like this, like kind of ever changing thing. It's not like uh, everything's always the same each year. Money changes typically, especially if you're an artist who's working for themselves and having to keep track of all this stuff on their own. Mm. Some years are way better than others. I think everybody knows that mm. uh, in general, but especially when you're working for yourself. So. Yeah really important to keep track of where you're going and getting a good CPA or accountant on your board on your in your space will definitely help you control a lot of that mm. so uh Amanda made this beautiful mm -hmm. equation that I really appreciate uh I mean it's simple but it's also like seeing it written like this I was like ah yes <laughs> That's, yeah that makes a lot more sense this is the the product of um my entire career as an elementary student um you know, learning about <laughs> basic algebra math for and how, how an art historian applies this. But so this is a, a handy tool. Um, so in many instances, you know how much money you're going to get for a project or how much you're pitching for. Um, so, you know, like Roxana was showing, there was a grant that was for $5,000. Okay. Um, I, I, how am I going to work with this 5,000? Well, there are many times where maybe you get the grant, but they say, well, looks like you applied for 20,000, but we're gonna give you 18. And you're like, oh, okay, well, how do I adjust everything then to 18 to total? Or, you know, with art in public places, we like to do this thing where we really torture people, where <laughs> we say, you know, there, maybe there's a, a you know, two or $300,000 commission budget, but you can pitch for a project that has a smaller amount of that and it's up to you to build that budget from scratch. So how do you build a budget from scratch? How do you know how to deal with these kind of percentages that we're recommending if you're building the budget out of nowhere, if you don't have a number to start with? Um, so this is kind of a little bit of a, of a simple equation that um, helps you to kind of get a sense of, of, of what the percentages start to be. So um, I'm going to, I'm kind of like moving my own mouse. I know you can't see it, but over on the top left, there's where it says $15,000. We're kind of making the um, assumption that, um, um, you know, all right, let me back up one more step. So, you, so in order to start making a budget from scratch, you can do a few things. You can start with like a pie in the sky number where you're like, hey, let me just grab a number that I want to start with. And then I'll start breaking down categories of that percentage, you know, 15% for artist fee, 5% for contingency, et cetera, et cetera. 
you may find that that does or does not work for you. Um, you know, you may find that that you need to wiggle wiggle those numbers through a little bit more and and, and refine the math a little bit more. Um, another way to kind of do it is to solve for a kind of a cross multiplication. Um, and 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 this this kind of um, this kind of thing you're solving for. You know, you may need to solve for any value that isn't there. So, for example, um, if you get a number and you're like, okay, well, I don't know, for example, how much my total budget's going to be, but I think I will need um, to spend based on my cost per unit of a material. I think I'm going to need to spend, you know, thirty thousand dollars. So um, $30,000 might be your materials budget amount. And we had said earlier that, that this could be some percentage between 20 and 50%. You know, give yourself a 20%, you know, just get start from somewhere. So if you do a little piece of math where, where, where $30,000 is actually 20% of your budget, mm -hmm. then you know that there's an you know, when you're solved for the cross multi multiplication, that 80% of your budget, you know, what, what that represents. And then you have the 100% when you add those two together. So um, <laughs> I, want, I want to be able to, you know, explain this. Sometimes it's really, really easy to do it or easier to do it showing pen on paper. But, um, but essentially you're figuring out, okay, if this is this percent, then my other value is going to be this. And now I know what 100% is and I can start breaking down what's 5% of that. Okay. What's, you know, 18% of that for my artist fee. And that will give you a sense of, you know, starting to just break these pieces down um, and building your budget from scratch. Um, oftentimes, as it says on the bottom left here, um, if you can identify contingency and artist fee, um, which gives you you know, between 18 to 20 percent um, of that artist fee, and then a contingency of five percent. If again, that that will take up if you add those together. You know, on the high end, 20 plus 10, 30 percent. Okay, so now I've got six, 70 percent for the rest of those line items, and it it really does help when you start working with real numbers. When you start getting one real estimate or one real sense of okay, well, what's even my studio overhead for a month? You know, starting that way. Um, that can kind of help to just start filling in the numbers. And as you can continue to refine them, um, getting it, the percentages into places that you're comfortable with that you, when you do do all those line items out, you're saying, okay, these are starting to make sense. This is how much I'm spending on each category. Um, I'm hoping that that's coming across. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> it's hard to explain math on a, um, you know, without doing it actually, but you know, as long as you're like, what's, what is, um, what number represents 100 as I have in the, as we have in the top left here, um, or, or, you know, let me solve for what number represents 100, you know, let me solve for that, for that, say if we didn't know what 15,000 was, but we did know what, um, set, you have letter C here, C could be, you know, representing something you do know, um, that's actually 5% of, you know, because you have a five underneath there. Um, so, so that, you know, starting with one number will, will help you get, get to the rest. So we have a lot of questions in the chat. <laughs> okay, great. So let's go try to get through those, um, which, um, I'm sorry, I feel like we, <laughs> we were like really, uh, getting in there. Um, so, so <laughs> have any, the first question is, do you have any account accountant recommendations? I personally do not. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I use my father's accountant, but she's in West Palm Beach, so it's like a whole thing to get to her. But if anybody else might have one, that'd be great. Um, so, or we can also put it in the document later, so it's like we actually can give them contact information. Yeah, um, you know, this is this is um, right. Always kind of a one of those personal things that um, it kind of comes through a network and it might also come through, uh, it looks like Danielle, Danielle has a, ha, or Diana has a, uh, a tip here. There, there's, there's different ways to start going about it, whether you just start looking at CPAs in your area or, you know, creative planning tools and who is running the business or, you know, just start, starting to reach around, um, 
you know, asking friends, asking family, who, who have you worked with? Do you think they would give us, a, you know, give me a shot? Um, there's Carla Gomez says H and R Block. Yeah, you know, there, there's there's all kinds of different ways. Um, and Roxanne, I'm not sure if you have more experience with this, but you know, I, I often start with asking friends and family. That's kind of the the a way that gets started, and then doing some further research and seeing if you find somebody that's a good fit that you know will work with you. You're saying, look, I'm an artist. I'm I'm doing project specific stuff. I just need some advice here and there, or you know, what's your what's your you know, what's your rate for working on these things? It's another line item you can put in your budget, right? That's a professional service that if you need to get covered, an accounting person, you can put that in your budget. You know, that's a professional fee that, you know, studio overhead, if you will, that's one of those kinds of fees that you can actually say, look, I need to pay this accountant $500 um, a month or uh, a quarter to help me do this stuff. And now it's in my budget. Right. Yeah, no, uh, definitely friends and family are out, artist friends, particularly, um, you know, and sometimes it's one of those things where an artist friend may tell you, well, I had a horrible experience with this, with this accountant for two, three years, and now I changed to this accountant who understands much better what I do. Um, I, you, once you start talking to people, you're going to get a, a better idea. I know the Arts and Business Council uh, provide, tries to put you put organizations in touch with pro bono um, accountants. I'm not sure if they do, if they provide the same service for artists. I'm not sure if legal art also, uh, Amanda, do you know if they try to, to provide a list or? Yeah, this was something that they really did do, but um, I'm unfamiliar if that's something that they continue to do, legal art, legal link, which I now, which became sort of, you know, bounced around from Cannonball to Locust. And now I think it's kind of independent entity again, um, legal link and legal art. Um, yeah. But, you know, I don't want to send people down red herrings. It's definitely something that you need to spend a little time and research on. Um, exactly, yeah. And I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very excited, Michelle, that you plan on an offering one on tax reporting because that's gonna that's gonna bring up a very good conversations. I mean, uh, w one of the things that you definitely have to keep in mind, for example, if you if you have your studio home uh, at home, then um, you know there's a way for you to deduct that through percentages in your in your taxes as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely something to stay tuned for the next uh, skills tax workshop. So, I'll tune in for sure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Jenna Ephraim asks, um, can a materials count as carryover? No. I think carryover is like uh, actual money. Yeah, carryover is actual money that you're saying, you know, and this is kind of not typical for a lot of grant applications. I think the language more or less is contingency. Um, and you can say that, you know, you're planning or there might be like a part two of your project that is going to happen next year where you're, or the year when it, when it finishes that, that allows you to, you know, do some financial planning for, for your next step of the project or to close out the project. Um, but no, this should be an actual bucket of money that you are, you know, that's just real money. This actually uh, goes into a question from Juan that said, are materials that you already have in kind value uh, to put in a budget proposal, um, even if they are your own? Well, you know, not really because you own them. So you're not getting them from somebody else. They're not being brought into your project. Um, if you, you know, if you're trying really hard scrambling to build up your, your in-kind dollar, um, that would be a personal, you know, decision if you're like well i have this whole pile of stuff here maybe you got it for free somehow anyway um and it's worth this and you're going to use it sure you know that might be a good option but um you know only, i would only do that if you were really trying to reach reach an in-kind number um because you could use that for something else you know and if you didn't get it specifically for your project then you're putting yourself at a disadvantage that's my opinion um, and then the 15 num there, so two questions about the 1500 number when the paying yourself, uh, what's the word, equation. Um, so uh, where does the 1500 come from? And then somebody else, um, do you want your, ask, do you want your yearly salary expectations or total budget that includes materials, et cetera? 
the oh, great. That's million. the creative capital, um, Roxana. That's the creative capital. Why why start with um, the fifteen hundred as part of that equation? And actually, that's a great question. I don't know why they start with fifteen hundred. Um, I'm not sure if the fifteen hundred. I think the two questions are the fifteen hundred maybe coming from the budget sample that 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 we showed for the installation project. If I well, no, it's, it's that one. Yeah, that's like the how do you pay yourself annually? How do you pay yourself weekly? How do you pay yourself daily, hourly? Right, right, right. right. The, there is a part of the formula has a certain number of hours that you're possibly allocating, you know, to your to your work practice per 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 day, per week that add up to the total number of hours in the year. Yeah. Uh, so, so if the oh. question is, will that total number include materials? No, that number is just to come to, to come up with your own artistic daily, hourly, weekly rate, material separate. Yeah. So I think the best way to think about this is like at your job, right? When you get given a paycheck at a job that doesn't count like the work, the money that is spent at your institution to do things, right? So they're not like, you're not having to calculate those things together. But yeah, the 1500 number, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, about 30 hours per week of hours, like out, actual hours of working hours. So that number can be higher. Like if you work more like 40 hours or even higher, right. you can change that number, but that's kind of like a general number. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a question that says, as a panelist, would you be disappointed slash turn away an application if the budget provided did not provide numbers, but did provide a list of what the monies would be allocated to? Uh, yes. <laughs> I can say that pretty well, Yeah, so, so first, if the application includes a budget form and you didn't complete the budget form, your application is considered incomplete and it may not even make it to the panel because it will be considered incomplete if you say that you are just listing where the money's come, coming from in the narrative, but did not fill out the budget form that is provided with the application, most funders will provide a budget form or will tell you download the budget form here, use this link to provide the budget. If you don't fill that out, there are chances that your application will not be reviewed by the panel. It will it will die there because your but your application will be considered an incomplete budget. Uh, I'm sorry, application. Um, the so I hope that that answers the question. In and a, and a side answer to the question. Sometimes projects can be complicated. There is nothing wrong with you taking a paragraph in your narrative to explain certain things about the budget that the panel will appreciate because if 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 there are some nuances that you think the budget will not show or will not tell go ahead and include it as a paragraph in your in your narratives it will be highly appreciated yeah and i and i i feel like my answer was a bit curt but essentially with budgets um they don't it isn't an actual budget for the funder if it doesn't show the numbers of what things are going to go for because what you're doing here when you're submitting a budget to anybody is you're kind of showing them that you know what you're doing so submitting a budget without numbers you're essentially kind of you're putting yourself at like at a loss in a lot of ways so as roxanne i did say in most instances you would actually be disqualified immediately for doing that um so you you don't want to have you don't want anyone guessing anything about your project you want it to be very clear what you're working on, how you're going to spend money, what where the money's coming from, and when you do things like keeping certain things out, you are deliberately or or unintentionally you are essentially making it so the panel has to guess that stuff, um, and typically that means they, they're not going to get guess correctly. Um, so um, Jen Clay, what it asked, what is foundation support, um, and that's like usually support that comes from an organization or. Um, a group of some sort. And that can be like a partner, sponsor, people of that sort. There's a couple of uh, typical buckets of funds that you can apply for. Foundation support typically means a private not-for-profit foundation that is set up with private dollars that someone has decided I have, now I have a foundation and I'm gonna give this money away. Uh, an example is the Knight Foundation. 
The Knight Foundation, oh. Miami Foundation, there are other family foundations. Um, there are foundations that are even um, the, the library, Miami County Public Library. This this is this advice is mostly for organizations, not so much for artists, but I'll say it. there is a list of a comprehensive list of foundations that development um, staff, you know, if, follows and 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 cultivates a, fa a fa foundations that you know will provide support for very particular interests and mm -hmm. work and where can people find that again Roxanne the downtown branch at the Miami County Public Library um you, you know if you call they'll, they'll probably put you in contact with the person who can give you advice before you would have to go and make an appointment, but there may be an online portal now that you can sign up, something something like that. Yeah, um, so that's private foundations. And then of course there's public dollars that are coming through this, you know, states, um, federal, uh, county, city. So that's, that's those monies. Um, and then of course, the last way to really earn money is through earned income. So, you know, throwing a party, uh, throwing a carnival, <laughs> throwing a, doing something where you're, you're, you're earning money one way or another uh, to, you know, for the purposes of, you know, fundraising, um, having a dinner, things like that. So yeah, there's typically three major ways to raise funds, private, public, and earned. Yeah, and, and private and pri in addition to foundation and grant support, uh, either local, um, regional, state, uh, federal level, um, private donations are, can also be considered. So if you have uh, private don private donors that want to contribute towards your project, if you're cultivating them, then you can include projections in your budget as well. Uh, and those private donors may include family members as well. So, you know, when you're short on your revenues, if you're looking for an extra, um, if you're looking to, to narrow a funding gap, you towards the end, I would just say towards the end, you can get a, a little creative with certain things. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the budget forms vary. And your budget, it's like squeezing your budget and squeezing the shape of your, your, your project into a particular budget form. Mm -hmm. um, it might not always be the right fit. And, you know, you, you have to do a little bit of homework through the guidelines, through contacting the person to explain your budget, I'm sorry, your project, so that they can give you some guidance. And in doing so, you'll start understanding where some more of the money can come from for your project. Yeah. I'm answering some of the more specific questions people asked about their own okay. project. I just wanted to say that Jenna Efren noted that Peace of Mind Bookkeeping in Plantation, Florida works yeah. with artists and creative organizations for bookkeeping and that's great. And someone else mentioned H&R Block and another person mentioned the Bench Accounting app. Um, is a helpful thing. So definitely a couple tools floating around out there that, that are new to me. I, I'd like to have some help as well. <laughs> yes, we, yes. So someone- Michelle, we can't wait for that session. I know, I know. <laughs> I, I, even for myself, it's funny- No pressure. I sessions, but I know that I need help with almost every category that I made these sessions about. And maybe that's partially my own, like, like I know the problems, you know? Um, but so Jenna Efren asked two, twofold, a twofold question about contingencies. Um, she's like, can you give an example of what would go under a contingency? Um, and like what is leftover slash carryover money, like the difference between those two things. Yeah, I, I think I, I threw a, a real wrench in with this, this uh, carryover thing, but the, you know, a contingency is a very normal thing to have in a budget. It's something that every grantee and every pitch for, for something is, is gonna appreciate because it's showing that you're saying, hey, this is the money that we might need if this project say, well, something goes a little bit over budget, something unplanned pops up, I've got a little bit of money, a small amount of money, 5% of the overall budget that I'm going to be able to tap into. Now, sometimes the question becomes, well, what do you do with that money if you don't spend it? Um, 
And that's something you, you might want to address, you know, with the, the funder. Some people are like, go on a vacation, have a great time. You know, like that's your tip for running your project so tightly. Um, uh, at Art in Public Places, we actually try to, you know, if it's a commission, we try to ask the artist, well, look, you have this much in your contingency. We'd actually love to use that money to acquire, you know, another work from you, a smaller, maybe it's a two-dimensional work for the collection um, so that we can use the money that way. Um, it, it depends on that funder and that the conversation, um, but more almost uh, any project I have to say that I've ever run, you're going to, you're going to use that contingency. Um, you're going to use it almost certainly. So it just provides a little bit of a buffer for things that are unexpected or things that are a little bit more expensive than you thought they would be. Now, carryover is something that <clears throat> is really more at like an institutional level. So again, I kind of, I threw in a wrench here a little bit, but carryover is like when you're running a not-for-profit or when you're running some kind of agency or business uh, and artists are, you know, business people and you're running businesses or the structure of a small business in many cases, you know, this is maybe it's not for your oh, one, this one small project, but when you're looking at your year, you're going to say, okay, how much money am I making this year? How much am I going to have at the end of the year um, or at the end of this cycle where I'm, you know, working on a bunch of things that um, maybe I'm going to pay myself from that, but maybe I'm actually going to put this in a reserve that is going to help me, you know, I might, you know, that'll, that'll be left over for the next year so that I'm not at zero, zero. Um, and that can, you know, some artists are like, well, look, this is the money I, I use to do my art projects. I put it in this bank account and I don't, I only use it for my art projects. And like, then here's my bank account for my life because, you know, honestly, it's very confusing and, and, and um, difficult to have it all combined together. So <clears throat> that, that's sort of my perspective is that if you know you're running something year to year, it's really nice to be like, look, I'm going to put this aside. I know it's going to be there for me next year. Every year, maybe it's not so much a profit, but maybe it's like, this is my carryover. I know that I'm going to not be at zero. I know I'm going to have, you know, such and such dollars in my account that when I start the next year, they'll be there for me, you know, as a buffer. I don't know, Roxanne, if you have other thoughts about that. No, I mean, it, you put it uh, really well and really clearly. Um, so you, you check with the, again, check with the guidelines to see it, it depends, if allowed. Like, right, yeah. if allowed for, for uh, right. If you're applying to something like it's uh, for a program that is supporting either a mix of artists and organizations, it may not be allowed, but yeah. yeah. Um, it's more of a business of practice here. in general than it is um, like perhaps pertaining to a specific project budget. But exactly. you know, it also may be something that if you know you are allowed to have a contingency and mostly you can, and you know that you're allowed to do whatever you want with that contingency, then you're yep. like, hmm, maybe I'll put that in my carryover account. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And actually, it it um it reminded me of something that that we didn't mention, which is, um, well, you sort of mentioned that when you're proposing a budget for a commission, it's a pitch. Mm -hmm. It's very similar in a grant application. It's mm -hmm. just that your pitch has to be well researched. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you move forward and things start happening, like Amanda says, and unplanned things come up and the, the expenses change, then there will be room for you to adjust uh, either your grant reporting or you'll talk to the administrator and say, this came up or right. I have to postpone my project, da, da, da. So keep close contact with the person who's helping you with the grant and they'll help you on how to navigate, you know, those fluctuations with yeah. your expenses. Um, if you end up with money right at the end, exactly what to do, uh, things of that, of that sort. Um, right. I, I, I know we, we probably have more questions, Michelle, but I just wanted to mention two things before I forget. One is that um, in, the, in the list of resources, we're mentioning some some grant opportunities that are coming up and two is that um we didn't touch upon uh 
COVID-19 and the, and the help that's, that, uh, you know, some institutions are providing, but, you know, there are some amazing lists out there. And uh, one of the, the opportunities that are coming up is by NALAC, uh, National Association of Latino Artists, um, and something else I forgot, I'm sorry. Uh, and that is funding that you can apply for if you've been financially affected by the pandemic and if you are in, um, in great need. Um, I know that uh, we were keeping in the department's page a list um, of uh, COVID-19 related opportunities. Um, Fountainhead also has a running list. And one more thing to consider is that right now some credit cards are offering breaks. Uh, you know, um, some they're they're uh, you know, if, if so, if you're dealing with with debt, you know that it might be a good chance to look into what you can do. Uh, interest rates, you know, are, are perhaps are negotiable right now. So it, it's it's um so th those those are the things that I guess I just wanted to bring up to make sure that we're we're also covering that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we have two questions left. So I will just. I feel like you've gone over already such a, a, a much longer, we've already gone over 15 minutes, but That's great, yeah. so there's one question that says, is studio rental included here in the sample budget because it would be part of the funder's template, um, even though there's no money in that row, and we can't take any more questions also now, sorry, because uh, we're super far over, but so um, I would say most funders aren't going to actually put the, the studio overhead in it, but in most instances you can consider studio overhead in your budget. Um, but they, they won't typically be on a budget form because not everybody has studio overhead. But in some instances, when it is an artist specific grant, they will already have that included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, it varies. It's one of those questions that you can reach out to the administrator, but but do that exercise for yourself, definitely. It just, you know, the administrator will help you where to place it in a budget or will tell you, you know, for this particular grant where we're not able to include overhead expenses, do not add the studio rental. They may tell you that, but but you may find, you know, a different way of, of, sh of showing that in the budget somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and our last question is from, as an artist it's saying, if you work at home, how much, uh, estimated in terms of rough percentages of your housing costs and, and utilities can qualify for overhead since you know we do have to do overhead. Um, and it says, for example, accountants tend to advise self-employed professionals to deduct, to deduct no more than one third of their home as used for work um, to not raise issues with the IRS. Yeah, that's some good advice. I think we had, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, like there, there's a sort of a percentage of your, right, of your home that accountants tend to, to recommend so that you don't get into, into trouble with, with the government. Um, and, you know, I think that's a great accounting question. Yeah. But, but, you know, certainly having a home studio, right, what does it cost for you to, to keep that up and, and how much of that is you know, is that a is is that number a third of your overall house household costs? Um, it sounds like a good yeah. place to start, but it's really an accountant question. It is, it is, because it also has to do with the way that you do your taxes. If you file as a sole proprietor, if you file, um, you know, if you have an LLC, if you file, you so it varies. And I think they also take into account the square footage. Yeah, I was like, I saw this comment. I was like, yeah, totally. That's exactly part of right. it. It's based on the percentage of square footage in your overall home that is dedicated to business purposes from yeah. um, Leti and Adam Rabble. So that's that's very helpful. So it's a very specific, that's a very, very specific issue to like have to come up with the numbers for. Um, and I think a CPA definitely will be able to give you a lot more clear answers on how to process that and keep that as part mm -hmm. of your like, annual budget. But yeah. yeah. Great that, that question it's like not as simple as it seems <laughs> it's like, no, it's like, it but I love that we're already but people are already thinking about these things I mean that's the details. thing so you you just keep going until you get your answer and then you 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 know we all we all we're all gonna tune into the session though <laughs> yeah and we're like gonna and learn and you know there's no gonna there's I think the further that we research these things, the more we may discover the nuance and the lay levels of 
um, you know, say this sort of specific contextual factors that are going to make your thing work for you the best. Um, so there's no right answer for everyone, but there's going to be a combination of factors that make sense for you. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, we totally went a lot longer than I expected us to. Um, but this was a great session. Uh, again, we definitely need to go a little deeper uh, with a CPA on this <laughs> to get uh, to unlike more of the tax side of things. That tax conversation is going to be a whole big conversation. I know that for sure. Um, and I wanted to remind you all something I mentioned in the beginning. ReadyMag, our partner for the last session, is offering uh, demos on how to use their platform to build your portfolio and to build your web presence on March 11th at 10 a.m. So here, I'm going to put the link in the chat uh, here, and it's to register for the Zoom. I'll also be sending it via email as well. And I want to again thank you, Amanda and Roxana, for joining me today. This is really lovely. Um, this is our final session for Artist Toolbox 101. For this particular round, we're going to be doing it again because we see how important it has been and really helpful for people. And I want to thank everybody again for attending today. Oh, great. Well, what a pleasure, Michelle. Thank you so much for inviting, you know, inviting us. And it, it's um, it's a joy. So thank you so much. Great. Yes, absolutely. I love being part of it. And congratulations to like Michelle, Danielle, the whole team for putting this together. I tune into other two sessions and you guys are doing an amazing job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I actually feel great. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> okay, take care. Bye. Thank you.